Hello everybody and welcome to Curious, our science education space right here inside the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. This is where we're broadcasting today's episode of Smithsonian Science How. We are so happy to have you here. Today we're going to be exploring real sea monsters, fossil plesiosaurs. Whoa! <laughs> I cannot wait to start. I'm Maggie Benson. Hello, everyone. I'm Emmanuel Tabor, and I can't wait to dive into some plesiosaurs. <laughs> you know what? I'm not diving into anything if there are plesiosaurs in there. Oh, yeah, that would probably be a little scary. All right, like I said, we are here in our Curious Education space, and we are going to meet our fossil expert now. She is a paleobiologist here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Dr. Laura Soule. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us today. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, so do you study the Loch Ness Monster? What, what do paleobiologists do? <laughs> right, so I am a paleobiologist. I'm also the deep time education specialist here at the National Museum of Natural History. So that basically means I get to do my two favorite things for my job. I study evolution using fossils. That's the paleobiology part that I do behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And then I spend a lot of time in this space, curious, talking to our visitors and teaching them about my research. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. Does the Loch Ness Monster exist? <laughs> yeah, tell us what a paleobiologist thinks. <laughs> a paleobiologist really, really wants the Loch Ness Monster to exist. Wouldn't that be amazing if we could see like a real life plesiosaur today? So this isn't real? Sadly, no. <laughs> yeah, you know, Loch Ness is just not big enough to support an animal like that. There's not enough fish in that whole loch, in the whole lake. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm telling you, we definitely would have found it by now because we've been looking very carefully. Mm. Now, Nessie kind of looks like a plesiosaur. Yeah, definitely. The, the body plan of a plesiosaur and what people think Nessie looks like are definitely very similar. So that's maybe where we got that myth from. And that's what we're seeing here. Some of these illustrations of what sea monsters and plesiosaurs might have looked like. Yeah, they're pretty terrifying though. Would you really want Nessie to exist if I, it looked I, like that? Not really, no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this one is actually getting its neck chomped. Did they <laughs> all have ferocious teeth like this? So they did all of, all of the different species in the group that I study um, do have sharp spiky teeth. Oh. Um, so we can take a look at some of those. You, you have like some teeth to, to show us today? I some teeth with me. Yeah, totally. Oh, are these some of the teeth? Yeah, so this is a great example of those huge, enormous, sharp, spiky teeth. This uh -oh. is an animal called Leopleurodon, and that one's got crazy teeth. Right? That's terrifying. Mm. They're really, they're pretty horrifying. Looks kind of like an alien. <laughs> you know what? I know people want to find Nessie, but if Nessie looked like this, I don't think I'd want to meet her. Yeah, Nessie, stay home. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you had some fossil teeth today? Yes. So I can show you these. We can hold them? Yes. All right. Ooh, I can't wait. Yes. So this is a fossil tooth that is millions of years old. Wow. Yep, these are real fossils that are millions of years old. They're ah. from two different species of plesiosaur. Mm. What oh. do you notice about these teeth? Well, this one is like long and pointy, mm -hmm. but it also has uh, these lines going up and down it. Yep. Mine is definitely smaller, but it is also very spiky, and um, it also has lines on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really great observations from looking at the fossils. But what do you think teeth like this would have been used for eating? Hmm. Um, so probably like meat, like fish, or maybe even a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> Good guess. I would also say fish. Maybe birds? Could they snatch mm. birds up with that long neck? Or mm. other plesiosaurs? Maybe. Well, they definitely would have been using these to eat meat, but probably not a cheeseburger. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is actually a really good example of one of the things that we do in paleobiology research. We look at things like teeth to try and figure out what different ancient animals might have eaten. And those observations that you made about how they're sharp and spiky tell us the kinds of things that they would have eaten. So does the size of the tooth. Um, and we can compare that to other animals. So over here, um, do you want to we'll put it back in put here? Put these back in, and thank you. All right, so awesome. we have another animal over here. Yeah, so this is a single tooth from a mammoth. This um, right here? Yes. Wait, 
Is a mammoth a plesiosaur? <laughs> no, no, so mammoths are actually uh, a relative of elephants that live mm. today. So they're part of the group Proboscidea is the word. But, so, um, like yeah. a woolly mammoth? Yeah, it's oh, a woolly okay, mammoth. Okay. It's not a marine reptile, not living in the oceans. So what are we seeing? That tooth looks very different, nothing like our plesiosaur teeth that we were just holding. Yeah, exactly. So this is a completely different type of tooth. You can see this is the chewing surface here, and it has these grooves down it, but overall it's very flat. Mm. And this kind of tooth is really well adapted for grinding up grass, which is what mammoths ate. And by looking at the shape of the tooth, we can make inferences about what mammoths ate in the same way that we did for the plesiosaurs. So these sharp, pointy teeth are good for eating meat, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everything with a sharp and pointy tooth is related very closely to each other. Right, exactly. Mm. There were lots of different types of marine reptiles. There are lots of different types of animals that eat meat, like here's the crocodile, for example. Crocodiles and uh, plesiosaurs aren't particularly closely related. Um, but there is a huge diversity of different marine reptiles and of different plesiosaurs. Really? Okay, so can you explain to us the different kind of plesiosaurs? Yeah, so if we look at this slideshow, there's going to be a bunch of pictures coming up here showing you all of the different shapes and sizes of these things. And like we said before, these were around for millions of years. The whole entire time that the dinosaurs were living, these were living in the oceans, even wow. though they're not dinosaurs. And so there was loads of time for lots of different species that look really different from each other to evolve. Wow, this is so amazing. Now, um, we want to remind our viewers that they can send in questions today. We see more people still joining us. We have Patterson, New Jersey. We have um, a lot of classes joining us. And you're showing us here the diversity of all of these plesiosaurs. Mm -hmm. right. Now, I think it's time to address the elephant, or should I say plesiosaur, mm -hmm. in the room. <laughs> That's right behind you. Yes. What is this? So I brought this specimen along with me. So what this is, is a type of plesiosaur, or sauropterygian. That's the group of animals that plesiosaurs belong to. And um, this is called Thalassiodracon. Thalassiodracon. Yeah, you got Thalassio it. Thalassiodracon. <laughs> sounds like dragon. It Kind of sounds like Drake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dragon is His where the name comes name. from. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if we look at this specimen, we can see all of the different features that a lot of these animals kind of have in common. So what we're looking at is kind of the belly side of so, the animal. Yeah. Mm. So at the top, you can see the head. It's pretty small. Teeny tiny head. A teeny tiny head. It's a teeny <laughs> tiny head. <laughs> and uh, so that's its bottom jaw there that you can see. And then if we go down, this is actually its neck. Mm. Look how many vertebrae it has in its neck. So no, many more than I have. Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> you have seven. This definitely doesn't have seven. It's definitely more than seven. <laughs> yeah. So what's this? Right, so if you look here, you can see flippers. So they have four flippers here. They're all, all its flippers are very similar to each other. But can you see that they have bones in them that are very similar? They're the same bones that we have in our arms. Mm. They're just a slightly different shape. So okay. it looks like this one's missing its hand, but would this bone be the same as my humerus? Yes, exactly. This is the humerus <laughs> of, this, of this specimen. <laughs> That's quite humerus. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yep, and then it has all the other bones that we have in our arms um, and lots of uh, kind of finger bones down here. Mm. Now, what's going on here? Yeah, so that's a bit of a weird bit, isn't it? But um, those are actually <laughs> belly ribs. So they had ribs that went around their back, but they also had some going down their stomach. I see. Um, and then we have this nice tail down here as well. We don't have a tail, but uh, plesiosaurs <laughs> did. <laughs> now, I'm looking at the tail and comparing it to the neck, mm -hmm. and the tail actually looks shorter than the neck. That's kind of weird. Yeah. yeah, these things really did have very long necks, some of them. Wow. Now, what did you call this? You did not call this a plesiosaur. Yeah, so this one is a type of plesiosaur, but it belongs to a group, and I like to study all of the different species in this group, and it's called Sauropterygia. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Can you say that one more time? Yeah, I'll say it slowly. So it's Sauropterygia. Oh, wow. Okay, so we have the pronunciation that's on the bottom of the screen right now, and I think it's a great idea for students to do this with us. I've been practicing saying this word for about two weeks, and I'm still learning how to do it. Let's see. Okay, so help us out. Yeah. Okay. Sorapterygia. 
Okay. Sarapterygia. Sarapterygia. <laughs> Practice makes perfect. We're going to get it. Mm -hmm. I think you guys have got it. So why were these animals called Sarapterygians? Well, the, the kind of literal translation of that word is actually lizard flippers. <laughs> lizard flippers? <laughs> That's a lot easier to remember than Sarapterygian. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good way to remember it. Although it is a little confusing because they're not actually a type of lizard but some of them look a bit like lizards, and I think mm. that's how they got their name. The flipper part, though, definitely correct. All of them had flippers. I see. So they're not lizards. So lizards are a kind of reptile, like these are? Yes, so these are a kind of reptile. So are lizards, these are marine reptiles. Lizards aren't. But um, they're also not dinosaurs, which a lot of people, I think, think they are. So they, they're a completely different group to the dinosaurs. Um, and they're not any of these other things that live in the ocean as well, like whales or sharks or anything like that. They're their own group, Sauropterygia. Okay. Awesome. So Sauropterygians, were they like teeny tiny little lizard flippers? Or were they like medium sized kind of deals like our Sauropterygian friend in the back that we just visited? Well, I think actually most people think of them as being these huge, ferocious ocean predators, right? And it's definitely true that some of them were like that. But Lizard flippers being teeny tiny also works as well because um, we've got specimens that are from quite early in their evolution where they were very, very small. Mm. I see some very, very small fossils here on this table. Are these some of them? Yes, so these are called Neustichosaurus. So we've got two little specimens oh. here. Um, and these, as you can see, are incredibly tiny, but they have all those features that the other the other Sauropterygians had. And these are actually how big they are. It's not like they were scaled down. Yep, exactly. This is an exact replica of the real fossil that comes from Italy. Oh, oh my gosh. It's actually really, really cute. Yeah, these yeah. guys are super cute. I, I like would them. definitely have one as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> Only they haven't been around for millions of years. Yeah, sadly, <laughs> we can't keep these pets any longer. Oh. Um, so I'm looking over Emmanuel's shoulder, and it looks like you've prepared an activity for us. Yes, I thought it would be fun to test out whether or not you know which one of these is a Sauropterygian and which aren't. Awesome. Oh. So students, here's an activity for both us and you. We're going to do the first three together, and you can just shout out your answer in your classroom. Mm -hmm. Sorry, teachers. <laughs> and then on the last one, on the fourth one, we're going to open it up as a poll. And to help me out, I'm going to remember that all of these animals are marine reptiles. Emmanuel, what are you going to use? OK, so Sauropterygian means lizard flippers. So I'm going to remember the lizard flippers. Got it. OK, we're ready for our activity. Mm -hmm. OK, this is number one. Is this a Sauropterygian? So using my cue, I think it looks marine, it's swimming, looks like a reptile, I'm gonna say yes. Okay, so it looks a bit lizard-like, I see flippers, so I'm gonna say Sauropterygian. Yep, correct, this is a Sauropterygian, oh. nice job. Woo! Nice. <laughs> All right. First one down, you ready for the next one? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so here we go, here's your next one. Mm. Okay, so... I'm seeing no flippers. It does look a little lizard-like, long neck, but I don't know. I'm gonna have to say not a Sauropterygian. Yeah, it has that long neck like the last one, but it does not look marine. I'm mm. gonna say no, not a Sauropterygian. You both got that right as well, and I think probably our viewers knew that it's a dinosaur. Nice, <laughs> nice. Okay, next one is this one. Okay, so it looks lizard-like, I see the flippers. So, Sauropterygian is my guess. Yeah, it looks marine. It's definitely swimming. It looks like a reptile. I'm going to agree. I'm going to say that, yes, this is another Sauropterygian. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've caught you out with this one. So, <gasps> this is actually a Mosasaur, which uh, is a different type a of marine mosasaur. reptile. Mosasaur? That was like a trick question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. There are lots of different types of marine reptiles, so you need to learn to tell them apart. Mm. <laughs> All right, let's test our... Uh, Let's do our last one for okay, our students. Okay, ready? Last one for the students. Is All right. This? Okay, let us know in the poll if you think this is a Sauropterygian, a lizard flipper, or not. Let you, us know. Use your clues. Is it a marine reptile? Does it look like it have, has flippers? Ninety-nine percent of our viewers think that that image was a Sauropterygian.
Oh, clearly all paleontologists in the making. <laughs> You're right. That was a Sauropteridian as well. All right. Awesome. Well done, students. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's get to some of our student paleontologists who are doing really great with observation um, now and get to some of their questions. I know we have a bunch. Great. Okay. Our student paleontologist, Fanwood, would like to know, where did you find plesiosaur fossils? So plesiosaur fossils are actually found all over the world. So we have them from every continent, even Antarctica. Wow. Um, but when I go find them, I always try and find them in North America. OK. So Elizabeth Wood would like to know, what is the difference between plesiosaurs and mosasaurs? There are a lot of differences between them. So they are both marine reptiles. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of similarities. And we're going to talk a bit more about that later. Um, but they have important differences as well. Mosasaurs are actually a type of lizard, um, but sauropterygians uh, are a separate group to them. And they have differences in the way that their bones are shaped, their size, um, and the way that they eat, and they, the, certainly the way that they swim was different too. Okay, and our third graders from the Little Flower School would like to know, when did you get interested in paleobiology? So I was, I was always very interested in evolution um, and trying to understand more about that. But really, I got extra interested in paleontology when I got to college and I found out a lot more about it. Um, so our students at the Fanwood School would like to know, were Sauropterygians deaf? They are actually a school of all deaf um, children, and they're getting the live stream interpreted to interpreted to them in ASL as we speak. Awesome, thank you so much. <laughs> okay, hi, so um, I think as far as we know, Sauropterygians would have been able to hear. Mm. So if we look at living reptiles today, um, they can hear and so we can infer that Sauropterygians, extinct reptiles in the past, would have been able to too. Although because they live in the water, they probably had a slightly different way of hearing than the ones that live on land. Mm. Interesting. So what about this flipper? Let's get back to that. Mm -hmm. Was there a period of time where they didn't have flippers if they were reptiles? Did they come from land to sea? Yeah, so this group actually evolved from ancestors that lived on the land. And I think if we can take a look at um, some of the pictures that we have, so like this guy here, what do you notice about its limbs? Um, they kind of look like fingers and not flippers. <laughs> I agree. So these things did live in the sea and they mm. swam around. They do kind of have flippers, but they're not the same as those uh, big ones on the, the cast that we were looking at um, or some of the other species that we see that have really large flippers. So these ones that were early on kind of have things that look more like legs, even though they were using them for swimming. Mm -hmm. Wow. So I see that the uh, there looks to be a flipper on this table here. Is that real? Yes. So this one, this one is a real fossil. Awesome. Can we see it? Yeah, for sure. So um, over time, new species evolved that had much larger flippers that were more stiff and more streamlined and were more effective for swimming very long distances. So what we've got here is actually just the end of a flipper. So it's just like right at the end. There would have been a lot more of it than this. Um, and it was from a very, very large marine reptile, a very large plesiosaur. Yeah, wow. it's so much bigger than your hand and it's even incomplete. Yeah, exactly. This is just the ends of the fingers, basically. Wow. Now, you showed us a gigantic flipper that is here on display at the National Museum of Natural History in the Sea Monsters on Earth exhibit. And we took a video so that we can show our viewers. Yeah, I think we should take a look. So viewers, take a look. Right now, we're in an exhibit in the museum that's called Sea Monsters Unearthed. And in this exhibit space, we have lots of marine reptiles on display lots of different species and they all come from Angola. Behind me there's the flipper of a type of plesiosaur called Caiocorax and here you can see all the bones that make up plesiosaur flippers. So this is a back flipper and at the top there is a big bone and that's kind of equivalent to the top bone in your leg, that's a femur. And then the next two bones down are the tibia and fibula, so those are like the bones that are in your shin. And then all of those bones down there are modified phalanges. So those are like the bones that make up your toes or your fingers. Wow, that is so cool. And it's so crazy to see how many different bones get added as that adaptation changes to mm. being in the water. Yeah. Um, so what features of the plesiosaur help you to study the, the plesiosaurs, how they lived back then? 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And we've kind of looked at a few things that you can use to understand how they lived and how they evolved, so mm -hmm. things like teeth and flippers. But one thing you might have noticed in the slideshow that we saw before is that they have very different body plans. And what that means is just the overall shape of their body. So if you think back, do you remember what those shapes were? They were kind of like long necked and round body a little bit. Like the bodies were definitely smaller than the necks. Yeah, look Somewhere. at how long that neck is that we're looking at here. Yeah. Yeah, so we have these ones with really long necks and tiny heads, but we also have other ones that have enormous heads and very short necks. And this thing was probably about the same size as a school bus. Whoa. Um, so they were enormous. And when researchers first started finding Sauropterygians, they kind of categorized them into those two different groups. Well, what does this one fit into? Because that <laughs> kind of looks like it's huge and ferocious and has a long neck. Yeah, so this one has a really long neck and it has a big head. So what we found out as we found more fossils was that the story was much more complicated than just those two different shapes. There were lots of in-between ones as well. Mm -hmm. And those two shapes evolved multiple times um, over time, over the millions of years that they were around. <laughs> so we have students in Wyoming, New Jersey, Maryland. Were there plesiosaurs there too? So we actually find plesiosaurs in many of those places. Definitely we get plesiosaurs from Wyoming, Kansas, mm. um, and Maryland as well. How? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it seems very strange now, right? Because, uh, you know, places like Wyoming, it's very dry. Um, and these are marine reptiles. But there actually used to be a very big seaway that went across North America called the Western Interior Seaway. And this was when the Earth was much warmer and the sea level was higher. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah, uh, what kind of animals lived in the Western Interior Seaway? It was a pretty nice place to live. So there were lots of different species that lived there. Um, so not only were there Sauropterygians, there were also Mosasaurs. Uh, there were things like lots and lots of sharks. We find lots of shark tooth fossils and ammonites, which is a thing you can see swimming across the back of the screen there right now. Um, yeah, so it's very diverse. Is that a plesiosaur? Yeah, it's a plesiosaur. <laughs> <laughs> we get some turtles as well. Nice. Wow, that's amazing. So are these places that you go to to find fossils, do you go to where this inland sea used to be? Yeah, so that is actually where I do my field work. And I'm very interested in this period of time um, because it's interesting to look at what happened when you go from it being land to being marine. You can see how the ecosystems changed. So yeah, I go out into Wyoming, into the Wind River Basin and the Bighorn Basin. Um, and is that I where you are on, in these pictures? Yes, all of these pictures I'm, I'm out in Wyoming. Oh, nice. So we saw you collecting some of those fossils. What happens when you collect them? Yeah, how do you collect them and then bring them back here to the museum? Well, so fossils are often very delicate, um, so we have to be very careful. And the first thing that we do when we find a bone fossil that we'd like to bring back to the museum is put plaster on it. So is this plaster kind of like the same plaster that you would get if you broke your arm? Yes, it's the exact same plaster that you would get if you broke your arm. I bandaged this like a broken arm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so are you protecting this fossil just like you would be protecting your broken arm? Yeah, exactly. So um, you can see here I've kind of started to open it up. And I know because I put the plaster on it that there is a bone just under here. But I can't mm. open it just yet because we have to make sure that all this bit around the edge is very well kind of glued solidly together so that it doesn't crumble and break when we open it up. We want to protect the bone. I see. Now you showed us behind the scenes what a fossil looks like after you've separated all of the rock from the real fossil mm -hmm. to be able to really keep it protected for perpetuity here in the museum collection. Yeah. Let's take a look. Even though fossils are made from rock, they can be very delicate. And some of the specimens that we have here will have stored for hundreds of years. So we need to find a way to keep them safe. And that's what these plaster jackets are. So these are specially designed and made here at the museum so that they cradle the fossils and have the weight of the fossil evenly distributed all over them. We've also designed them so that you can use them to flip the fossil over so that researchers can look at whichever side they want to and the fossil will still stay safe. Now the specimen that we're actually looking at here is a type of pliosaur. It's called Brachalcaneus lucasi, and this specimen is a very special one. It's the type specimen for the species. What that means is it defines what the species looks like. So when other researchers find a new fossil and they want to try and work out what it is, they can compare it to this one to see if it's the same kind of animal. What 
you can see here is actually the underside of the skull. So this is upside down at the moment. So the vertebrae here are in the neck. They attach to the head there. And then this is the lower jaw that you can see here. There are some of the teeth poking through this way. So it's like you're looking at its skull from this direction. <laughs> What happened to the Sauropterygians? We know that there are no sea monsters today, but where'd they go? Yeah, why can't I have one as a pet? <laughs> <laughs> I think there are other reasons for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so sadly, from my perspective, they all went extinct at the Cretaceous Paleogene mass extinction, which is one you might have heard of because it's when almost all the dinosaurs went extinct as well. So a huge asteroid hit the Earth and wiped out loads and loads of different species, called pretty, caused pretty widespread devastation. Um, so we never saw a Sauroptera gene again after that. Wow, and now you're hunting for fossils before that asteroid impact. When did that asteroid hit the Earth? Yes, yeah, so that was 66 million years ago, and we know that from looking at layers in the rock. We can figure out how long ago that actually was. Wow, wow that's incredible. <laughs> before we go, if we, if we had um, future paleobiologists out there, what would be their first step to get started? So I think the best first step to get started in paleontology or paleobiology is just to keep asking lots and lots of questions. However annoying your parents find it, just keep going, because that's all being a scientist is really, is asking questions. And let's get to some of these scientists now. Dakota Smith wants to know what she should do to find a fossil. So there are actually fossils all over North America. So if you're watching from anywhere in North America, there's probably fossil sites near you. And you can find out where those are online, but they're usually places like beaches or stream beds. Awesome. Uh, Andrew would like to know, did all marine reptiles have teeth? Yes, they did all have teeth. So they're reptiles and I don't, I'm trying to think now, I don't think any of them evolved to not have any teeth. They were mm. all swimming around with teeth in their mouths. Awesome. So one of our friends would like to know, did Sauropterygians lay eggs? That's mm. a great question, actually. Yeah, it's very interesting. It took us a while to work that out. And we actually found a fossil where it has a baby inside it what? that's what? just about to be born. <gasps> so we know that they didn't lay eggs because we found this amazing, beautifully preserved fossil. They actually gave birth to live young, like dolphins do. Wow. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. That's totally cool. Um, so back to our friends from the Little Flower School. Um, how many plesiosaurs have you found? How many plesiosaurs have I found? Um, I think I would probably say, so I found a lot of different uh, bones in the field last year, and I'm not sure yet whether or not they're plesiosaurs, but I think probably three. You know, this follows up on another great question that somebody asked, how does it feel when you find a fossil? <laughs> oh, it's the most exciting thing ever. <laughs> you know, because it's, it's really hard to find these things and you spend hours walking around in Wyoming in the hot sun and there's snakes and bears. <laughs> Sounds dangerous. <laughs> it's, it can be pretty dangerous. Um, but then sometimes you see like a little bit of bone poking out the ground and it's the best thing ever. Uh, awesome. Really keeps you going. Yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Laura, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your amazing Sauropterygians with yes. us. Are we going to be able to um, display any Sauropterygians in our new deep time hall? <laughs> yep, so the hall is opening in a couple of months and this one that you can just see on the screen there is going to be in the hall. So you can come see it yourself. Uh -huh. So everybody mark your calendar. We will have a new hall of deep time, lots of fossils, including our new friends, the Sauropterygians. Thank you so much for joining us and we will see you next time on Smithsonian Science How. Bye bye.